Philippe, I think you're on mute. Philippe, you're still on mute. Uh, welcome, everyone. I think we're having a bit of a technical issue. So if you can just give us a minute um, and we'll, we'll go ahead and restart. Thank you. Cheryl, I see. I don't think uh, Philippe sounds working. One of you want to maybe just kick it off to, to John and we'll get started that way. Uh, sure. Why don't we go ahead and do that? Um, or let me do a quick introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. Again, um, it looks like um, uh, Philippe, who is our host, um, he's on mute. So let me go ahead and um, start this call. First of all, thank you so much for joining today's call. Um, we have people from joining from all over the world. Um, thank you for you know, joining us as we start our full webinar series and for your interest in the topic of the plastic waste crisis and how we can collaborate to solve it. Um, I'm Aysu Katsun, I'm the Director of Sustainability at GRIF. And today um, we have a very special guest with, guest with us, um, John Reves. Um, he is the Director of Plastics and Back Packaging at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Um, Greif has been a member of WBCSD since 2009. And for the last couple of years, we have been active participants of their circular economy and energy solutions programs. So John is here today to talk to us about the challenge of plastic waste, um, some of the programs at WBCSD that address this issue, and some of the emerging trends and opportunities. So with that, I will pass the floor to you, John. Thank you so much, Asu. I'm just loading my slides, so hopefully we can get that to function. Great. So uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Aisu, and for giving us this uh, opportunity um, to share with your, uh, with your customers. Um, it's a privilege um, to be able to talk to you um, and your members around uh, the issue of, uh, of plastic waste. Um, I'm going to use my time to just briefly introduce the work of the World Business Council to you, um, some basic concepts around the circular economy before diving into specific issues around plastics and circularity. And then I'd like to finish off with a more positive note around the emerging trends and opportunities for business to contribute towards uh, the solutions. Um, I'd like to start with a, a quote that I absolutely love. If you um, would like to uh, use the chat box to tell me um, who said this uh, very wise statement, um, it would, uh, it, I'd be amazed, but let's see if anyone can get it. But anyway, listen up, we should get rid of trees. We have to, because they're the source of forest fires. So of course, we all want simple solutions, right? Um, like, let's get rid of plastics. But some solutions require systemic change, which is much, much harder. So we need to create in this, in our case for plastics, a new system that circulates 10 times the amount of plastic than today. The answer is not to get rid of plastics and the answer is not to get rid of trees. Uh, just seeing whether anyone's come up with a comment. Um, so I see there are two. It's not Trump, believe it or not. It is uh, Billy Connolly, who um, uh, I'm sure you've known him, a very anarchic Glaswegian co comedian. 
Um, and I, I thank him for coming up with that great quote. So just more about the work of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Uh, we're a global CEO-led organization of around 200 forward-thinking businesses working together to accelerate the transition to a sustainable world. And together we develop transformational business solutions to the most challenging issues of society, delivering results that no company could achieve and by itself. And if you like, that is built into the DNA of our organization. And we celebrate our 25th anniversary and have around 200 members. Um, some of you on the call may well uh, be members, in which case a special uh, welcome uh, to you. And Greif is a longstanding member, as Asu uh, said. So our work is split into six program areas, of which the one I work in in plastics and packaging is highlighted there on the left um, within the circular economy. So let's talk a little bit more around uh, the circular economy. Where did this come from? So uh, since 1970, global resource use has tripled. Without transformational change in how we produce and consume global resource would double by 2060 compared to today. Every year we consume more resources than our planet can sustainably support, placing extreme pressure on its systems. Extraction and processing of materials, fuels and food are responsible for 90% of biodiversity loss, 90% of water stress, 50% of greenhouse gas emissions, and a third of pollution health impacts. To give you an idea, today's society produces around 2 billion tons of waste, of which only 20% is recycled or composted. So what's the role of business within that? Uh, we believe that the future of business is circular. Business will increasingly use a circular mindset to create inclusive and sustainable value with no waste. Ultimately, economic activity will need to become independent of resource consumption and avoid the environmental impacts of extraction and disposal. And you can see on this chart here how that breaks down by material area and in fact doubling over the past 20 years at such a scale that concerningly material productivity declined between 2000 and 2010 as production of materials and itself overtook regard as to the efficiency of which those resources were extracted. And you can see it is now leveled, but it's still stagnated. So we need to move from a one-way model of production, use, and disposal to a circular model. This is what it looks like, and this is often called the butterfly model as promoted by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Look at the right hand side, which references technical materials like plastics. It adopts the idea of keeping materials in the tightest loop possible, avoiding the creation of waste wherever possible. Any waste generated at end of life is recycled wherever feasible and any remaining materials are either incinerated for energy recovery, recovery or landfilled. Now let's look at just how we apply that to plastics. Um, the diagram is a few years old, so this is 2016 data, but I love it for its clarity. And I think it's a good source to use. So today we produce around 300 million tons of plastic. That's nearly equivalent to the weight of the entire human population, by the way. From that, we create 260 million tons of plastic waste. So that's because 16%, as you can see on the top, is collected for recycling. And of that 16%, around 9% comes back into the plastics value chain. So the vast majority is not in any loop whatsoever. 25% was incinerated, and the remaining around 60% was landfilled, taken to unmanaged dumps, or leaks into nature. And that's a good time now to just introduce our first poll question, which Cheryl is going to put up. 
Which, and here's the question, how concerning is the issue of plastic waste for your organization? And just while you're thinking about answering that, um, you can see on the right hand side, some 8 million tons of plastic is estimated to leak into the oceans every year. That's the equivalent of dumping a garbage truck every minute. The photo on the right is one I took of plastic waste collected off a protected bird sanctuary off Bermuda. And I think we'll all agree it's really shocking. The world needs a better way to manage plastics. And with that, Cheryl, do we have some answers? Okay, so um, uh, I'm delighted and that's reassuring for us to know that 64% um, um, of uh, your organizations um, find uh, this issue of plastic waste very concerning. Um, and uh, just moving on now, then your company is part of this growing trend. So what we see across the business world is that business is starting to make ambitious uh, commitments, um, both in terms of their um, materials are being recyclable, reusable, or compostable. And secondly, on specific targets on post-consumer recycled content. Equally as relevant and critical is that business is starting to lead innovation towards circular solutions. And as we'll be talking to uh, later, um, collaboration is absolutely critical across the supply chain um, to create and understand um, how that innovation can work. And equally, we see there is growing demand for recycled plastic as well as for alternative materials. And there are a number of business initiatives that are really demonstrating leadership um, in this area. And your organizations may well be part of any of the ones listed. Um, and uh, we're really uh, delighted to see that business now sees itself as being part of the solution and not just uh, part of the problem. So just to bring you right up to date, um, the Pew Breaking the Plastic Wave report came out last month. This provides a comprehensive assessment of pathways towards stopping ocean plastic pollution. So I think on one side, you have the reality of the problem, and then you know, what are we going to do about it? And you can see on the left-hand side, it paints a pretty bleak picture of business as usual. And on their estimates, you can see that by 2040, we'll be generating twice as much uh, plastic. The risk is if we continue with business as usual, plastic leakage into the ocean will triple. And the amount of plastic actually in, within the ocean is going to go up four times. To really need to change the system requires implementing all the possible solutions which are highlighted on the right hand side of the rainbow chart. And I won't go through them, but you can start to see um, in the modeling that's taken place, it's not a question of highlighting one specific strategy. We need all the strategies together to actually get on top of uh, this, um, this issue. I thought you'd also be quite interested to have an understanding of how COVID has affected um, all of this. A recent academic study that I've highlighted on the chart identified six changes in plastics usage, all of which have increased plastic waste generation. On the other side, the capacity of the waste management services to deal with this waste has decreased. In one case, there's an estimate that 34% of recycling companies in the US have been partially or completely closed. In addition, there have been some single use packaging measures that have been lifted or temporarily delayed. And for example, Scotland has delayed its deposit return system until 2022. The COVID-19 pandemic has underlined the role of plastics as an irreplaceable material to society, but also reinforces awareness of the issues of proper plastic use and managed disposal.
So let's just finish looking at some emerging trends and opportunities. So you may, may well um, have seen these products as consumers on the shelf, or you'll be um, part of a supply chain helping to support your customers um, to innovate and um, identify solutions. So I put them into two categories here. Firstly, the elimination of problematic substances and unnecessary packaging. And secondly, uh, the change of materials. So for some, it's taken too long for this to happen. But I think we all know that changes like this take time to come through the system. The other thing that is evolving quite quickly is the availability of methodology that allows users of plastics to identify and, quanti and quantify the amount of plastic leakage across their own supply chain. These so-called plastic leakage guidelines, PLP guidelines, which are publicly available, helps quantify the leakage in tons or kilos of plastics from the, their main sources and the pathways. It's easily um, uh, downloadable as a guideline and I would um, endorse that to you. Tools like this help companies, in this case, I've highlighted Arla Foods, which is a dairy company, and to their credit, they have put this information in the public domain. They're one of the largest dairy cooperatives in the world, and it turns out they use a lot of plastics, of which they now understand for the first time that around 860 tons leaks into the ocean every year. That's quite a responsibility for their company, but knowing what and where allows them to focus on how they can reduce it. And I know that is absolutely the case inside that organization. I'd like to just tackle the regulatory landscape. Um, so many of you um, will be aware, and if you do business in the EU, um, this um, circular economy action plan focuses on what it calls high impact sectors. And that covers electronics, packaging, plastics, food, and water. So this action plan is something you simply cannot ignore if you do business in Europe. The World Business Council is shortly to publish a report to our members on the business implications, and it highlights three recommendations. Firstly, getting the right people involved. What I mean by that is um, onboarding your leadership and your executive uh, commitment to align the whole business around circularity. Um, secondly, to grow your own knowledge and to start to show and tell and get visibility of what's working inside your company and what isn't. Secondly, become experts, circular, sustainable and financial. Focus on the financial. Understand what financial instruments you can use and how to reinforce the circular economy with your existing climate change ambitions. We'll also encourage you to get connected and network with the wider circular economy community. Lastly, um, do draw in the business economy towards you and create incentives within your business. Make sure you're the company that's building the leaders and incentive mechanisms inside your sector and start to integrate new tools, such as the one I identified earlier, um, as well as using digital solutions um, to help drive a circular economy. And lastly, leverage existing standards that um, are publicly available that help align with your circular business practices. And lastly, I'd just like to focus on our own work inside the WBCSD in this area. Um, in discussion with our members, um, we wanted to be able to support uh, with our own work. And we will be starting this month a plastics and packaging project which aims to develop and promote solutions that manage the transition to circularity for plastics, helping companies across the value chain to accelerate their own transition and to facilitate system transformation. We've identified five work streams of interest, which we are currently scoping with our members. And from these five, we will prioritize two to three and agree deliverables um, towards the end of October. 
This project is open to WBCSD members and to non-members and do contact me separately if this is something of interest to you. And with that, I've left my contact details here and I'm, um, I believe there'll be a chance for some Q&A towards the end of this webinar. So with that, I'll hand back to Asu. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And as we pull up our slides, um, I found that very insightful and I hope that our participants, our audience members have also find it just as insightful. And uh, as John said, I would like to remind our audience that you can ask your questions to John. Um, if you look down at the window, um, you'll see a chat um, button. Um, so please ask your questions to John and the Gripe team through the chat function and we will get to them at the end of our presentation. So John has clearly outlined the urgency of the global plastic waste crisis. And as corporations, we have a responsibility to be a part of the solution. And as we do that, as you've seen from John's examples, we can also create value both for our businesses and our stakeholders. Uh, many of you have attended our sustainability and plastics webinars that we held back in the spring summertime where we covered in depth the solutions that Grife provides uh, to reduce and minimize plastic use and plastic waste. So I will only do a quick summary of our solutions and then we will share some of our best practices with you. Um, at Grife, as you can see from this slide, um, our circular programs are an integral part of our sustainability strategy. When it comes to plastic packaging, first and foremost, we focus on reducing the amount of virgin raw materials that we use. Uh, secondly, we focus on reducing plastic waste from our operations by reusing um, scrap plastic that, that is generated from our operations and through working with organizations like Operation Clean Sweep. Thirdly, we focus on developing products made with recycled plastics. And finally, we focus on the collection, recycling, and reconditioning of used plastic packaging. We can move on to the next slide. So here, um, as you will recall, I mentioned that our first and foremost priority is to reduce the raw materials that we use. So we do that in two separate ways. The first one is to develop product and process innovations to downgauge or lightweight our product. So the products that you see on the slide are just some of the examples. So for example, on the top left corner, you see our next drum and next to it are J JCR jerry cans. Those are 15% lighter than their alternatives, for example. Or you see um, uh, a, our one liter plastic bottles. Those are 25% lighter than um, the traditional um, one liter plastic bottles. So we're continuously working to find ways to make our pro uh, products lighter to reduce uh, less raw materials while at the same time keeping performance the same. Um, we've done this with our IBCs. We've also done this with our flexible packaging product solutions. The second um, area that we focus on is finding alternative raw materials such as, such as bioplastics, which we have done in Latin America with, with our jerry cans. As I mentioned, the second biggest uh, focus area for us is to manufacture products using recycled plastics or PCR. We call this line of products our eco-balanced product line. Um, and I will shortly share with you, you know, where we manufacture these products. But as you can see here, we currently have the capability to manufacture PCR products that include our uh, plastic drums of various different sizes, open head, tight head. Um, some of those drums have UN certifications. We're also able to manufacture IBCs with PCR. As you can see here, we have both a black um, IBC and a transparent one. We also have the capability of producing jerry cans with PCR. And the amount of PCR that we use changes from product to product, application to application, but we have the capability to manufacture um, some of these products up to 100% PCR. And this is a line of products that we are continuously uh, working to expand. And the last area where we have our focus is our end of life services that we provide. So it's extremely important for us that we have the capability to take care of our products at the end of their lives. So we have created our Earthwinded Lifecycle Services back in 2000, I believe, 10. Um, and I'll show also the locations for that um, with you as well. But basically this um, service or uh, business was created to collect, clean, 
uh, reshape, recondition, recycle, and reuse uh, the packaging products that we manufacture. And the only way we can do this is with collaboration with our customers. And we provide the same service for our pla flexible packaging products as well through our review business, uh, which is located in the Netherlands. We can move on to the next slide. So here you can see where we manufacture our um, PCR products. In North America, we're in, uh, we have the capability of doing this in four different states. As you can see here, Illinois, Pennsylvania, Texas, and uh, Georgia. And in Europe, we have the capability of manufacturing PCR products in six countries, including Spain, UK, Sweden, Netherlands, uh, Germany, and Italy. We can go on to the next slide. And here you can see where we have the capability of providing end of life services to our customers. Um, as I've mentioned, we, are, we provide these services in North America and Europe currently. The green circles that you see are Grife sites um, and the blue circles that you see are the partners that we are working with to provide end of life services um, to our customers. So these are just some of the solutions that we offer at Grife to help minimize plastic waste and also plastic use. Um, but due to the scale of this issue and the urgency to implement solutions, individual company efforts like ours can only take us so far. We all need the collaboration of all stakeholders along our value chains, ch uh, chains whether it's our suppliers or customers or ideally both. And only when we can start collaborating at a large scale can we start to make a significant impact and start seeing changes. So with that, I will pass it to my colleagues, Kevin and Luca, um, who will share with you some of uh, our best practices and examples of collaboration. Thanks, Isu, and hello, everyone. Uh, one of the unique vantage points we have is, is we get to see how we use our customers, find innovative ways to really maximize our products. And the first example we want to share today is with a customer in North America that is utilizing our tapered drums. Now, one caveat, the customer is not packaging uh, UN regulated goods, so they're not constricted with the uh, five year max life of the drum. But with that in mind, they essentially created a fleet of drums. They, they fill the drums, ship them out, use and empty the drum, and then they clean and return it. The key is that tapered or nestability of the tapered drum, which allows them to get almost twice the number of drums and return shipments. Not only does this return or return optimization cut their freight costs in half, it also reduces their emissions in half. To take it a step further, uh, years ago, we, we co-developed the size of the drum to optimize the number they can get not only in over the road trailers, but also in rail cars as they utilize both means of transportation to return the, the drums. Now, we don't even know today what the entire fleet size is, but we do know that they're using over 300,000 what we call drum equivalents per year. Uh, again, in, in cleaning and reusing with at most a 1% scrap rate. Now, we tried to quantify this and, and we came up with it. It's the offset equivalent of if you were to drive a car 15,000 times around the globe, which just blows my mind that essentially that is the amount of emissions they're saving. Uh, from optimizing the use of these drums in just this closed loop environment and, and utilizing it by themselves. So you know, the goal of sharing is hopefully maybe somebody out there, this might stimulate you think about your, uh, you know, your business and maybe something like this is applicable to you. Uh, if so, please reach out. We'd love to share more information. And, and just as a, a general comment, uh, the drum is adaptable to all different business models available in 20 to 55 gallons and a diverse number of lock bands and covers available. With that, I'll turn it over to Luca. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Again, so I would like now to introduce uh, a little bit of uh, a different concept of uh, managing IBCs, because as you know, we are producing our GQ by IBC. And uh, uh, ISO introduced uh, some specific example about the product development uh, in direction of sustainability. But the management of the IBC can be also a good way of uh, um, ha having a strong reduction of CO2 emissions and then having a better control of IBC. So what we are doing with the leasing model is uh, indeed uh, to help our customers to keep a better control of the IBC, moving away the BC management and uh, what is related to it, uh, take over the management of the IBC 
with the final goal to provide to our customer the right amount of IBCs needed for their fillings. Customer is willing to, is then in charge for the shipping of the filled IBC to the final users, and then the IBC are then collected back by Gryph, and then we enter in a loop where we can either wash IBCs, rebottle IBCs, so repairing IBC. So in this case, uh, really, we have a, a complete uh, control of uh, this IBC. The point is, uh, uh, it's not running only in a specific country, but uh, we can uh, establish a way to have it enlarged at a larger scale in different regions or all around the globe. So uh, there is no limitation for having an IBC, which has been filled in Europe, shipped in US, and then collected in the US by Gryph, or vice versa, because uh, as we said before, we are acting at a global scale, and through this network, we can uh, take care about uh, uh, your IBCs. You can, uh, uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, there are a lot of benefits around this. So first of all, really, the sustainability impact on this. IBCs are not lost anymore. But then there are a lot of other advantages also for your business. You can reduce your cost. You have a really reduced lead time for IBC because you are receiving it as soon as you need it. Uh, there is a, an avoidance of uh, a lot of uh, hidden costs. You can increase your sales because the people which is in charge today of handling IBC will be dedicated to your business, which is what you need to take care of. And then a reduction of uh, legal implication. And then it's important for all of us today, also the reduction of uh, operating working capital, which is uh, a big voice uh, in our uh, balance sheet every every year and then uh, last but not least uh, having a clear packaging cost because uh, today this is uh, for some of our customers uh, really unclear so this is really a uh, few words around uh, the leasing but then uh, we can uh, we can detail uh, discuss in details every time you need more information reaching out to us now we are moving to some specific example again on a product that we have developed together with our customer this is a, a quite a good example about a customer in the chemical industry, which were looking for uh, combining a very high quality drum, which is in this case, uh, something which is needed for uh, anti stress cracking drum, because uh, the chemical which are quite aggressive on it, uh, are keeping uh, the inner layer in uh, uh, anti stress cracking specific polyethylene, so it's a virgin material, but all the remaining part, which is uh, really representing a big portion of the total weight of the drum, is now produced uh, in 70% PCR and 30% virgin HDP. So we have calculated for these specific customers multiplied by the volumes of drums that they were buying a specific calculation about the CO2 emissions reduction that uh, they, uh, they, they could have achieved together with uh, this uh, project. And then we have seen that they have been able to reduce by 37% of CO2 emission with this uh, specific solution. So we have been able really to help this customer in a very, very strong uh, way. Moving to the next uh, example uh, here, uh, there is uh, something that uh, we did also in developing a new series of uh, jerrycans, what is called uh, our JCR, our jerrycans reinforced. Reinforced, reducing the overall weight of the jerrycan. So this is uh, uh, the, uh, the line which is now available uh, almost everywhere where Gryph is producing jerrycans. So we uniformed the, the design of jerrycans uh, in every country where we are doing it. And while we did it, we reduced uh, the overall weight, uh, keeping uh, the traditional performances of heavier jerrycans, uh, thanks to a specific design with uh, some reinforcement uh, in uh, the shaping of our, of our jerrycan. So also in this case, uh, there are a lot of details behind this uh, project, but basically uh, we are uh, offering to our customer the opportunity to keep performances of their shipment. So they are not changing almost anything in their uh, deliveries to final customers, but uh, for every shipment that they are doing it, they are saving more than 13% of uh, CO2 emissions. So that's really an example about uh, another way of uh, helping the planet to better perform in terms of uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, project. So moving uh, to the uh, next, I will end over now to uh, Cheryl in order to have uh, a wrap up of uh, this presentation. Thanks. So thanks. So you can reach out to me for any specific question as soon as you want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luca. And before Cheryl takes over, I would just like to um, finalize with, with a couple of words. So we have 
shared with you a couple, just a couple of examples of the types of projects um, that we are working with, with our customers on to both help them uh, reduce their carbon emissions, um, but also reduce the amount of plastic use and reduce the amount of plastic waste. As I mentioned um, earlier, it's only when we can collaborate will we make significant changes and significant impact on the global waste um, crisis um, that we're seeing. So we're really here to help you determine, um, you know, basically we have tools like the green tool that we have previously talked about in our um, webinars that, will, uh, that can allow you to find out, you know, your carbon emissions impact from the packaging products that you get from Grife. Um, we can conduct different types of scenario analysis with you so that you can determine exactly how much you can reduce your carbon emissions, but also how much you can reduce um, the materials and, and material waste. And we can come up with, um, just like the examples that we have shared, we can come up with ideas for collaboration um, around, again, you know, reducing carbon emissions, reducing plastic waste, so that you, know, you can reach your sustainability targets, but so that we can collectively you know, make a difference um, globally around this global uh, waste um, crisis. So with that, um, I will pass it to Cheryl and please keep um, asking questions. I know that we've been getting some, but please keep asking your questions um, so that we can now um, start um, responding to those questions. Thank you. Thanks, Aisu. So yes, as Aisu um, mentioned, we have the chat button. I know there's a couple of people who are raising their hands. Um, please type your, um, your question in the chat button and we will get to those in the order that we received them. So. If we want to start, um, since you start, you ended with collaboration there, Isu. I think a good question would be for John. You know, can you give us some examples or two best practices that you've seen companies implement, like examples of collaboration that you've seen? Yes, yeah, Cheryl, I'll be I'll be happy to. I think there are there are a few really good examples that come to mind. Um, one is um, a European organization called CFlex, um, which um, is a business association. Um, around the flexibles uh, business. And they've recently introduced um, guidelines that give real clarity to brand owners and to users of flexible packaging uh, on what structures they should be innovating in order to support and to achieve a circular economy for flexible packaging. Um, I think that's a great example for um, you know, a sector that is um, under specific um, pressure um, um, taking the, uh, a position of uh, realizing they need to um, help and support and the sustainability of their, uh, of their own sector by um, identifying and supporting their customers to innovate. Um, and there is an enormous amount um, that is happening in that space. I think the second one is around uh, plastic pacts. And um, some of you may have seen in the US um, last week, there was an announcement about that really exciting um, packed in, um, in that um, uh, for North America. Um, though plastic packs um, look at bringing together the whole value chain to make joint commitments around um, plastics, um, um, understanding and how to eliminate problematic materials in those markets, um, commitments on the percentage of recycled um, content, um, commitments around um, achieving the goal of 100% reusable, recyclable, compostable, um, and more importantly, and just as importantly, a real commitment to ensure that materials are not just recyclable, but are effectively uh, recycled. I think the last one is um, the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, um, which uh, the World Business Council has had some involvement with um, some 50 large multinationals have committed to invest one and a half billion dollars over the next um, five years towards solutions that prevent leakage and recovery of valuable materials. And their goal is to demonstrate the investment opportunities of um, recovery and um, recycling of plastic materials at end of life. So I think there are um, some really good examples already underway. Thank you for sharing that with us. Excellent information. Um, Luca and Kevin, we have a couple of questions regarding our PCR um, products. So the first one is, are there any UN DOT restrictions for use of PCR with dangerous goods? Yeah, Luca, let me start with that one and maybe you can chime in. <clears throat> you know, it was about 20 years ago 
when the, the UN approval was first given to be able to manufacture a plastic drum with a, uh, a UN mark. Uh, currently, uh, the same is not true with an IBC. And I think that's why we've seen a big segregation in the progression with drums using PCR material, but IBCs have lacked. Uh, it is something that Greif, uh, is, is we aggregate it as an industry, that through the International Confederation of Plastic Packaging and a few of the other global industries, uh, we have presented papers and recommendations to the UN for approval. Uh, today, uh, we still don't have it, but we're confident that that is changing very soon. Uh, with that in mind, Greif has decided to move forward with uh, development of the IBC with PCR in the bottle. Uh, again, knowing today that it's not, it's only for non-UN applications, but we see that change in here in the near future. Yeah, just, just a very small point to add. Uh, internally, we made all the tests and then uh, we can uh, really state that uh, what we have seen in our results is that uh, IBCs made uh, with the PCR bottle are able to resist uh, to Y1.6 uh, uh, UN approval test. So now it's a matter really to have uh, this approval by the ADR, uh, ADR regulation. And uh, the goal for Grife is as soon as it will be ready, we want to be ready starting from the day one. Thank you. And so in addition to that, there's some questions regarding um, the possible limitations on colors for the PCR packages. There was you know, a photo of, of a very white light color one like we have in the, in the IBC. And then they said sometimes it's difficult with light colors because of their collection techniques. So can you share a little bit uh, more about the, the color um, and color changes with the PCR product? Yeah, so everything is related to the ability to, uh, to collect and then to have a good selection of uh, the raw material because uh, basically we are collecting uh, empty uh, jerry cans, uh, drums, IBCs. And through the selection, now we are able to have, uh, I don't know, for the IBCs, a specific uh, PCR coming from IBC collection. So the source is uh, IBC and the result is that the PCR that we are using for IBC is now is also transparent. Uh, there is a yellowing effect, which is typically about the fact that uh, polyethylene is uh, uh, recycled and then there is a transformation process and the final effect is this uh, yellowing. But the transparency is absolutely uh, uh, allowed. Now we are also, we have also started uh, to make uh, transparent jerry cans, uh, uh, with uh, the selection of uh, transparent jerry cans uh, at the beginning, and then uh, with uh, this uh, process, uh, we are able to generate uh, PCR, which is transparent. Historical, darker, or uh, is uh, the, 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 the color of the final product easier it was, because uh, then you can mix uh, all the type of uh, colors. But now, with uh, the enlarged quantity of incoming material, we are able to have a better process. It's not easy, but uh, this is also where we, are, uh, we need the help of our customer to collect the more, and then through an agar collection, we can also have a better selection. The result that can be uh, better, more, uh, better is the, the quality of the raw material uh, arriving up front. Yeah, one comment to add to that, and you can see in my virtual background, we're showing the, uh, one of our new state-of-the-art uh, multi-layer blow molders. In the multi-layer technology, we are able to put the mixed color regrind PCR in the center layer, and then we essentially encapsulate it with a virgin material. Uh, in doing that, we typically can cover up, uh, you know, various colors and, and offer, you know, a variety of colors from your, your standard blue, blacks, whites, uh, and even naturals. Although natural, you, we typically make it slightly thicker in the outer layers to cover up the middle layer. But, but it, uh, to the question, going forward, part of it for us is how we invest in technology is, is the key and what Greg's focusing on in order to still not only provide, say, your traditional black recycled uh, PCR drums, but uh, various colors that, that you're accustomed to today. Great, thank you. So a couple of questions. Um, one is, does Greif plan to expand the sustainability initiatives and footprint to Asia? I Sue, I'm not sure if you have a little bit more information on what we're doing in that part of the world. Sure, um, so when we look at our overall sustainability program, we are very active in every part of the world. So for example, I was talking to you about how we're trying to minimize plastic waste from our operations and we have a global 90% um, diversion from landfills goal. So we're trying to reach zero waste to landfill ultimately. So for example, in Asia right now, we have, I believe five facilities who are already zero waste to landfill. Um, and you know, we have numerous other initiatives too. When we are talking specifically about innovation and products and reconditioning and recycling, 
Um, basically, when it comes to reconditioning and recycling, we currently don't have any um, grad facilities in Asia, but we do when a customer comes to us with a request to, let's say, recondition and recycle um, their packaging products, we identify partners um, in Asia where we recommend our customers um, to, to work with, whom they can work with. Um, but we're also trying to gauge the demand um, to be able to invest in other regions. So this is where, you know, our customers, we, we need the feedback of our customers, where our customers come in. We really need your feedback on whether or not you would like Drive to create a network of recycling and reconditioning facilities in Asia. You know, once we have the demand, then we can make the investment truly to, to be able to expand to um, Asia and also Latin America is another um, region where we currently don't have grad facilities, but we would like to. We're just trying to gauge demand, basically. Um, when it comes to uh, PCR products, um, maybe Luca or Kevin, you can provide feedback um, in terms of our capabilities in Asia at this moment. Well, I have a clear example about what we are doing in China, because in China we are producing our GCube, and now we are working to have a, a local source of uh, PCR in order to be implemented, because uh, technically we have demonstrated that the DIVC is absolutely producible with 60% uh, of uh, the total weight uh, made by uh, PCR, and uh, now it's better to find the local uh, sources of uh, uh, this material in every country, and this is also valid for Asia. Great. And there was a question um, with regards to the actual locations for reconditioning in the Midwest. Um, we have been expanding our reconditioning um, footprint in the United States. And um, with, our, with our new um, partnership with the Centurion Group, and so I'll be happy to share with you um, after this um, session the actual locations. I can send you some more information on that so you can have those list of locations. Um, John, is, there's a very generic question here. It says, I believe much of the plastic that's being recycled or has a recycling symbol is not actually being recycled. And what can be done to resolve this issue? Yeah, that's the big, that's the big challenge. So I think um, for many years, um, producers of plastics and companies that use plastics and put them on the market um, felt that their responsibility um, was to ensure that their products were recyclable. I think the veil over that fallacy has now, you know, really been, been lifted. And as you've correctly pointed out, um, it is the recycling rate, how much of those materials are really being recycled and brought back, as you saw on one of the charts I showed, that is the, the, the only measure that is of, of relevance. Um, so I, I, um, I, I think, um, the reality of um, that the failures in that system is actually, you know, what is helping um, to fix it um, together with substantial investment that is now going in to um, collection and uh, recycling infrastructure. Um, and of course, the engine for that is the demand for post-consumer recycled content. So perhaps, the, you know, the positive way to, to look at this is that um, if there is market demand for recycled content, then the industry will step up to the plate, will ensure that collection and resorting and recycling to the right quality standards um, exist. Great, and for our European colleagues, um, there's a question regarding the EU virgin plastic tax. Will that affect our IDC drums, jerry cans? Do we have any details on that? So this is, um, as I, I'm sure our audience knows, um, this hasn't, it has been approved um, by the European Council, but the exact conditions have not been fully, uh, let's say, uh, what's the right word, confirmed or, or um, uh, clarified. Um, but in our case, as, you know, we've mentioned and you've seen from our products, we already have the capability to manufacture our products with PCR um, all the way up to 100% in some cases, like I said, depending on the application. Um, and where we have an advantage is that we have a recycling and reconditioning network. So in Europe, especially, um, we don't have an issue with, for example, sourcing high quality PCR. Um, it's all coming from our network. 
So obviously, you know, in terms of our, you know, business strategy, we will definitely, this will have an impact. How can it not? Um, and we are looking at, you know, our, the capability of switching more products to include PCR. We're looking at developing KPIs around including more PCR. Um, uh, so it's obviously going to have an impact in our business strategy and the development of our new products. Um, but personally, I see this as, as a very positive um, move um, because it's, it's a combination of companies developing solutions uh, companies coming together, collaborating, but it's also a combination of then government acting and coming up with regulations that really helps accelerate this move towards finding solutions. So I see this as a positive, but um, I hope I answered your question, but it's definitely going to have an impact um, on our business, but I believe in a positive way because we are positioned uh, well in this regard. And one point that I will also add is, you know, talking about um, you know, products having recyclable um, uh, symbols, but not being recycled. You know, in our case, again, um, we are in a great position in the sense that all of our plastic packaging products in our rigid packaging business are 100% recyclable. Um, so there's no question of it being recyclable. It comes back to whether or not it gets recycled. Um, and that depends on our customers. We can only collect and recycle and recondition products if our customers ask us to. So that's where, you know, we really need your collaboration so that we can actually collect the plastic drums and then recycle and recondition them. I hope that answered um, our um, customer's question. Thank you. There's a more chemical technical question here. It says, do you restrict the use of drums that contain certain products that permeate the plastic drums? Um, do you test for residual chemicals in the PCR? Sure, I, I can take that one. Um, so obviously with the diverse amount of chemicals, products that get packaged in drums, it, it does add complexity to the recycle and the reuse streams. Uh, for example, we, we immediately have to omit any division 6.1, 6.2s that, that have been contained previously in the drums from our recycle streams of poisons essentially. Uh, as far as permeation, uh, we don't per se uh, dismiss, you know, drums that last contain anything that could permeate. And, and keep in mind, permeation uh, is not limited to chemicals like toluene and, and xylene. Uh, mineral oil uh, and, and other, you know, food concentrates are also known permeables. Uh, oftentimes those packages coincide with having some sort of barrier used in the plastic. And as long as that barrier is recyclable, it can be brought back in. One of the keys, and, and we don't have 100% of the answers just yet, but Greif is commissioning a study to, to look at just that. So as you encapsulate, uh, are there any chemicals out there when you, when you take all the vast array of what could be done and you break it down into polarity, non-polarity, and the other sort of generalizations of where these chemicals would exist, are there any that we need to be concerned about to where uh, it would maybe further restrict our, our recycling? Um, keep in mind that the plastic is washed, it's grinded, uh, it is reheated over 400 degrees F. So, so there's a lot that goes into it that does take most of this out. Um, it, so it's a good question. Uh, we don't have the entire answer yet, but when we do, we'll be sharing it. But what we know today, we, we think for the most part that no, that is not an issue. Great, thank you. John, I think as we're coming to a close, I think we should um finish with you and talk about what gives you the most concern regarding the plastic waste, waste crisis and what gives you the most hope. So, you know, let's end on a positive note here. Um, so I think, you know, the, the reality of seeing the amount of plastic waste um, in the environment um, is of, you know, is of enormous concern. And that's, I guess, you know, when, you, when you're confronted by that, you just cannot ignore that. Um, but I think, you know, the positive story, and I think today's a great example, um, that, um, you know, once the issue is in, in the consciousness of business and society, um, then actually, you know, there is such a groundswell to, um, to ensure that plastics are effectively managed, um, that I think it's, um, it's unstoppable. Um, and, you know, society um, is, has been struggling for many years to come up with a significant response to climate change. 
Um, and part of that, I think, is because CO2 isn't visible. Plastics are very visible. And I, so I, I think that consciousness is not going away. And as I highlighted, I think um, the COVID pandemic is going to bring to the fore even more issues around how we manage plastic waste. Um, so I think, you know, the hope is actually um, that um, organizations like Rife, you can see the commitment of, of the team um, and the professionalism of which things are being done. The solutions are there. Um, and I think, um, um, you know, organizations like um, uh, WBCSD and uh, business associations from the ones I've, I've, I've cited are really getting behind how to um, not just see this as an opportunity for companies um, to um, market and to gain individual advantage, but to understand where they need to collaborate and scale up um, these solutions um, to create this systemic change that we need. Thank you. I agree. I know I see mentioned it, you know, it's the collaboration part and we are here to partner with you and we want you to reach out to us. Um, so before we let you go, a couple of important things. Um, we have relaunched our Discovered Rife webinar series. This was the first one back from our summer break and we have a couple of more coming up. We'll go into a deep dive into the lubricant market and our solutions for that industry on October 7th. And our TriShare Closure Group will share some of their new innovations and product en enhancements on October 28th with our Rigid Packaging Group. And so before we leave, I wanna launch one last poll we would like to know if you would like anyone from Grice to follow up with you, or if you would like any other further information from the World Business Council as well. Um, we will be happy to um, for, you know, send you some more information or have someone contact you to discuss this um, and more in the future. But again, thank you. We apologize for those technical issues at the beginning. Um, we appreciate you um, joining us and we wanna thank our speakers. John, thank you for, for coming from the World Business Council, Isu and Kevin and Luca from the Grice Group. Um, your expertise and knowledge is definitely um, obvious, and we want to take advantage of that. So as a customer, please feel free to reach out to all of us. And with that, I wish you a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.